This conference will now be recorded. So, uh, as I just said, last year, July last year, uh, the SNC North Alliance, who are now known as the uh, Central Rail Systems Alliance, carried out the switching cross and renewal at Acton Grange Junction. So, where's Acton Grange? For anyone who doesn't know where it is, it's, um, it's circled on this map here. So, it's on the West Coast Main Line. Um, and it's between Warrington Bank Key, you can see Warrington up the top right hand corner of the picture, and um, and crew is is off down to the down to the left. So just zoom in a little bit further. So this is the site itself. So the top left hand corner, you can see the railway going from the Manchester Ship Canal diagonally down. Um, and then at the bottom left corner you can see like a little brown sort of triangular triangular area in a field. So that's actually the site compound that we built for doing the um the job at Acton Grange. So I'll show you a little bit more of that shortly. Okay, so just a little bit of history about the, the site itself. Um, so the, the original track at Acton Grange wasn't where it is today. So you can see on this Google um, Google Earth screenshot is there is the Acton Grange viaduct and there's the track where it is today. But just beyond that, um, lower down and, and to the east of the current alignment, there's you can see like there's a hedge line coming up towards the river, um, sorry the canal and then going across. So that's the alignment that the railway used to take. The reason that it doesn't take that alignment anymore is because we decided to build the Manchester Ship Canal. So they had to um, divert the railway, you can see. Gents, if you, or ladies, sorry, if you aren't, um, if, can you just mute for now, please, if that's possible, so that Chris doesn't get interrupted? It's the bottom left button. It says Mike. If you just hit that, you'll be muted. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when you built the Manchester Ship Canal, they had to build, um, they had to divert the railways around and above it. So you can see on this this drawing I'm showing now, it says uh, Deviation Railway at the top. So this is actually Acton Grange Viaduct, and this is what the um, this is what they constructed to divert the railway, and that's what we've got today. Um, it's just a picture of them building the ship canal underneath the Acton Grange Viaduct, um, and also you can see that the you can see the height difference between the, the new track level and the existing. So if you look underneath the viaduct in the distance, I think that's the the old track alignment. You can see that the new track's considerably higher. So it's up on a, a new embankment as well, which gave us uh, quite a quite a bit of challenge during the during the job itself. Okay, so what was the actual job? So we had to renew 16 point ends in modern equivalents. So it was badged as a like for like renewal, which sounds like an easy job, but it was, uh, it was, it was far from easy. So it was modern equivalent materials. Um, we replaced four sets of switch diamonds as well. So I'll explain what switch diamonds are in a second. Uh, but on the, on, the, um, on the diagram at the bottom, the switch diamonds are the areas in the middle. So you can see um, 727C and B, 728B and C, and so, so on on the other side there, the switch diamonds. So to do this work, we had to have a 16-day blockade of the West Coast Main Line. So we blocked, we closed the West Coast Main Line between um, Crewe and Warrington. So as you can imagine, that's an expensive thing to do and causes massive disruption. It's the main, um, the main north-south route along the west side of the country. It's a, it's a really, really big job. Um, so diagram at the bottom just shows you the layout of the site. So the top two lines are the West Coast main lines you've got the down main on the top and then next you've got the up main so both of them lines have a uh, through this site the line speed was 100 mile an hour so it's pretty high speed track as well um, then underneath them you've got the hellsby lines which go off between uh, warrington and chester so the hellsby lines through the site they were 75 mile an hour so i said that explain what switch diamonds are for anyone who doesn't know so if you look at the, the down main the top line so trains would normally go from left to right along this line uh, but so that we can get over to the down Hellsby, we have a, a series of switches and crossings with switch diamonds in the middle. So if, if a train comes from Afton Bridge on that line, it can get to these points 727B. Um, and if they're set correctly, it will then take that path instead and it will cross over the up main without connecting with it. So switch diamonds are a way of allowing trains to cross over a line without, um, without joining it, if that sort of makes sense. So there's another way to do this. You can, if, if you if you just add the um, the track crossing at a, a quite a, a steep angle, um, you don't need switch diamonds. You can have what are called fixed diamonds. So that's basically just uh, flangeways cut through the the rails to allow the train to 
cross over that track. Um, but because of the the angle of the up main and down main to each other, and the and the, the, um, the angle of the switches that we had to that we had to install, and um, that that setup doesn't work, and there's not enough space for for um, for the wheels to take the right path, and for them to be round. So what you have instead is switch diamonds, which are a movable um, set of switches that. I'll show you shortly. I've got some photographs, so um, um, clarify exactly what I mean with that. And just one other thing to point out on this drawing is the, the speeds through these two um, parts of the junction. So to the left, um, we call this the or we call it the south end of the Grange Junction. You can see that it's got a 20 in, in the middle there, so that's saying that the line speed is 20 mile an hour across that part of the junction. If you look to the right, and uh, the north half of the junction notices that that's 50 mile an hour, so it's a, a much higher speed, and um, the track layout is is, is uh, completely different because of that. So I'll show you that now. Okay, so what was the job? As I say, it was to replace all of the all of the switching crossings at this junction. So I've shown this, and um, this is an extract from the track design drawing, and I've shown it just to give um, just to give an idea of the sort of the complexity and, and how much. Um, how much information and how much uh, detail goes into designing something like this. So what I'm showing here is the switch diamonds on the south part of the layout. So that was the 20 mile an hour uh, part of the layout. So you can see 727C and B in the middle there. And uh, on the other road, you've got 728C and 728B. So they're the switch diamonds. But like I say, it's, it's a very busy design, uh, lots going on. We go to the next page. This is the one of the switch diamonds at the north end. That's the 50 mile an hour highest high speed turnout. So you can see there straight away, although there's still a lot going on, um, the components are spaced much further apart from each other. Um, and you'll see that shortly in some photographs. Chris? Okay. Yeah. Harvey, how are you doing, mate? All right. Were, hey, they, um, were they full or shallow depth switch diamonds? Uh, they were full depth switch diamonds. Okay. I don't think you can get shallow depth, can you? In the switch diamonds, yeah. all the all the yeah. other switches were shallows, but the switch diamonds themselves were full. Full we'll depth. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just wanted yeah. to know. And now, the next question was how they were, how are they performing, but we can come to that in a bit. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Okay. No worries. Cheers. Uh, okay, so yeah, why did we need to do the job? So first off, the the, the assets were life expired or reaching the end of their life. So um, the the if you, if you look at some of them pictures, you can see, so on the right hand picture, you can see that there's wooden bearers throughout the layout. So uh, wooden bearers over time degrade and, and have to be replaced and uh, become a maintenance liability. But the most important thing I think was the reliability of this junction. So this junction um, racked up lots and lots of delay minutes over, over the, the years leading up to this job. So there's various reasons for that, but one particular issue was vibration through the switch diamonds. So when trains were passing over the switch diamonds, and the components were, were vibrating a lot, and it meant that the switches were losing the detection, uh, which causes a, a signal and fault, and then that means that the line might have to be blocked or, or um, fault teams go off the site. And any delay that that causes to train services cost a fortune for network rail. Um, I don't know the exact figures, but I think it's thousands of pounds per minute of delay. So obviously there was a, a, a lot of um, a lot of motivation to renew this junction and hopefully make it perform better. Okay, so leading up to the job, we had to do obviously as you can imagine lots of preparation. So one of the things we did was I mentioned before that there's a site compound um, shown on the Google Earth screenshot. So this is just a, a picture of the um, of the top end of the site compound. So within there you can see there's a load of port cabins. So then port cabins were offices. So you have Wi-Fi and basically work from there and do your, do your job as normal. Uh, obviously toilets and welfare facilities, that kind of thing. At the far end, you can just about see there's some access steps up onto the track. So they weren't there before, so we constructed them so that our um, teams could get straight onto site from the um, compound. Uh, we also built an SNC panel laydown area, which I've got some photos of shortly. But one thing I want to point out on this is the uh, the food van on the on the right hand side of the picture. So, a food van. I know when some of the maintenance colleagues came out to site, they were, they were a bit shocked that we had a, a van um, making burgers and I don't know, chips and all kinds of stuff, and that we were um, feeding feeding the staff. But um, it, we've done this on, on quite a few jobs. And what it actually means, it, well, it's, it's a couple of couple of things it does. It means that when it comes to lunch breaks, and um, that the teams can just stay on site and get something to eat fairly quick, and um, sit down, enjoy the lunch, and then get back on site in a decent amount of time. 
so you end up saving a bit of productivity in that way. Um, the other benefit is that I think it's, it's good for staff motivation if you if you're feeding someone during the shift. I think it, it, it goes a long way to uh, to make them feel that you actually care about the welfare. Um, and finally, uh, it means that you haven't got an army of people in orange uh, running around all the local village shops or, or uh, piling into Tesco's to get the lunch all at the same time. So it reduces the uh, effect on the local area slightly. Okay, uh, another way we prepared was by um, using what's called modular SNC. So uh, I won't get into the debate about modular SNC because I know that there's um, a bit of a drive now to, to avoid it and, and not use modular SNC, but um, I'll, I'll ignore that and I'll just um, explain what, why we used it and, and what it actually means. So modular SNC means that the, the new layouts that we have to install, so the new crossovers, switch diamonds, um, everything else, they're um, actually constructed off-site. So these particular ones were built in Doncaster by a company called BAE. Um, so they're built in in, a, in BAE's yard. So you can see there that the yard's enormous and, and the layout um, takes up, excuse me, the full length of their site. But um, what this means is when it when it's built up like that, um, it's, it's built in sort of controlled conditions and there's no rush. You're not worrying about having to um, give the track up to let trains pass and everything. It can be built in um, a sensible amount of time and in a, a virtually a factory environment. And it also means there's lots of time to check, to check the dimensions, check everything um, sits right, everything operates how it should do. And Network Rail actually have a team of SNC inspectors who come out to these sites and, and go through and do really comprehensive checks to make sure that everything is how it should be. Um, but what makes them modular is if you look on the left hand picture you can see down the middle um, that picture there's a series of plates with four screws in the top so what they are is they're the uh, modular shroud plates so if you were to take them plates off the concrete bearers would have a gap between them so if, instead of being one concrete bearer which is how traditionally um, snc layouts were built up it's actually two bearers um, bolted together or screwed together um, so what that means is you can build the whole layout up, as as, uh, as you can see there, and then you can take off them shrouds and unfasten um, the whole layout into a series of panels. So them panels can then be transported to site um, quite often by train. So there's tilt and wagons available, which um, allow the allow the panels to be brought straight to site. But uh, for our particular site, we brought them by road. So these panels were loaded onto road wagons and then driven from Doncaster across to Acton Grange in Cheshire. Um, just one other thing I want to point out on this picture. So you might be able to see in the very centre of the picture, there's uh, some of the bearers have got some paint on them. So you can see red and blue paint on, on there. So what that's for, and it's, it's a really good idea. I don't know who came up with this idea, but um, I think it's brilliant. So because these panels are, are taken apart and then brought to site like a jigsaw, you could potentially end up with something the wrong way around. So when you get them to site and try and install them, um, you end up with the and that they don't fit because the back to front and it's actually happened that it happened when we put in um little lime streets when we remodeled that um, that site there was um one panel was loaded onto the train the one wrong way around and we had to try and spin this panel and it was 18 meters long so imagine it's quite a huge amount of material and luckily we had just enough space to rotate it and um, by large sheets of the box but to stop that happening and um, what someone came up with the idea of doing is painting the ends of every panel so um because we're on the West Coast main line, you've got um, London one end and Glasgow the other end. Someone decided to paint one end blue, um, so that end goes towards Scotland, so blue for Scotland, and the other end red, so the red end um, goes towards uh, England. And that's and that's that's what we did, and it worked out really, really well. It's dead easy to see straight away that everything's um, the right way around. Okay, so I mentioned the laydown area next to the track. So the way we managed this was that we actually hired um, a farmer's field and completely covered it in this um, this highway aggregate material and then used it to lay out all of our materials. You can see on the left hand picture and um, that's actually one of the sets of switch diamonds sat on the back of a truck so it's delivered to site on the wagon um, and then just left left like that for, um, for our use. And then on the right hand picture you can see the massive massive crane that we used to get the uh, panels from the lay down area onto the track. It was, it was an absolute monster, that crane. Okay, the next thing to, to, to do to prepare was to work out the actual renewal sequence. So when it comes to renewing a, a, a site like this, 
um, it's it's a complex job. You've got materials to get to site. Um, as I mentioned before, it's up on a high embankment, so there's not a load of area next to the track where you can um, where you can lay things right next to the job. So you need engineering trains to be able to come into the site and get back out again. Um, you need all sorts of other engineer vehicles to be able to get in and out. So you can't just basically you can't just rip the whole thing out and then put it all back in in one go. Um, so this hopefully will work, but this is just this is what the site looked like looked like originally. Um, so the first stage was to um, what's called plain line the outside two lines. So what plain line means is to basically rip everything out, rip out all the switches and crossings, and replace it with plain track, so just sleepers and rails. Um, so you can see there that um, all of the switches and crossings have gone off the two lines, other than the last layout to the right. But uh, it's another story. Um, okay, so then we carried on with the plain line, and so eventually we ended up with pretty much everything for plain line. So four lines of, of just plain um, rails and sleepers with no S and C left. And then we began installing the switch diamonds. So we had to start at the switch diamonds and work out work outwards from there because they're the critical components. You need to be in exactly the right place, and then everything else builds out from there. So if you get them wrong, and um, that error will carry itself throughout the whole job. So start off installing the switch diamonds and then um, after that we tacked on the next um, SNC units until so eventually we uh, reinstated what was what was there before but in the new materials and then the last thing to do was this layout to the right hand side and replace that and there you go. Looks that easy when you when you put it on the on the screen like that but um, yeah, it wasn't quite as easy as that. Okay so during the job we had a few design challenges as well we, we had um, thousands of design challenges, but I thought I'd just talk about a, a, a quick couple of them. The first one was the, the tying in the alignment. So what I mean by that is that, so track is installed to a design alignment. So whether that be straight or, or curved or a combination of straight leading into curves by transitions, it does natural design geometry to the site. Um, and when you replace some track, you have to make sure that the new track marries up to the existing track. So yeah, that's called the tie-in, making sure that actually um, there's not a step or, or a gap or anything like that. You, you have to make sure that it ties in properly. So just these are some extracts from um, one particular track. Track So it was the up main. So if you look at the top um, picture, just hopefully you can see me here, Seth, but you can see that um, starting from the left-hand side, the track is, is in a curvature of uh, 30,000 meters in a kind of smiley face alignment. So as as we go along, that alignment um, then changes. You go through a set of switches and then the alignment changes via this transition. Um, and this is actually what's called the reverse transition. So you go from a smiley face to a sad face or from a left-hand curve to a right-hand curve. Um, and tra reverse transitions are, 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 um, can be a bit complex and we can, we can get uh, some difficulties as well. So. From, from that reverse transition, we then go into another curve um, of a uh, 12,000 meter radius. And then we go from there uh, by another transition into a straight. Uh, also I'm trying to get across to you there is that there's quite a few changes in geometry over this uh, fairly short area. But what made this difficult is um, obviously we have the S&C, the switches that I mentioned just then, but we've also got um, the viaduct, acting range viaduct to the right hand side. And what we really didn't want to do was go onto that viaduct and do anything related to it. So we didn't want to um, lift the track a lot. We didn't want to have to realign it. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one, one to do with the load and infrastructure itself. Another to do with the fact that it had guardrails fitted. So an extra set of rails, um, which we didn't really want to tamper if we didn't have to. Um, and just generally, it, it was best left well alone. So that's, that was one of the challenges to try and avoid touching that viaduct. So another challenge we had was to do with the ballast depths. So uh, network rail standards tell us what depth of ballast we need to install. So that's the stone that sits beneath the sleeper. Um, so for this, for most of this track, it was 300 millimeters of ballast needed to be installed. But when we done the site investigation, so um, when we went out and dug uh, holes to see what was beneath the track, we found um, a pitching layer, which was a layer of sandstone, um, sandstone blocks beneath the track. It's now, Pitching layers used to be installed or have been installed where there's like soft ground conditions or other problems. So when the, when the Victorian is built, and um, this this site, um, it appears that for some reason they came across a problem and they had to put in these pitching layers. So you really don't want to touch them. You don't want to remove them or excavate them or, or 
just there for them in any way if you can help it. Um, the problem with that is it means that we the places where we were struggling to get our 300 millimeters of ballast, so we had to try and um, lift the track, but we were restricted how much we could lift the track because we had the overhead line electrification above us um, and other constraints around. So that was a, a definite challenge. And another thing that affected ballast decks was um, shallow bridge decks. So on the right-hand picture, you can see um, at the top, there's a plan of um, a bridge which goes underneath the track. It's just bridge number 60A. Um, so when they investigated that site, when they built trials at that site, um, it appeared that the down main would be would be okay for getting the full ballast deck, but the up main um, it would um, we would struggle. So what we have to do there is install a different type of sleeper. So you can see on the left-hand picture at the bottom, it says G44 on that sleeper. So there the G44 is like the standard concrete sleeper that we install, full depth concrete sleeper. But we had to install eg 47s so various shallow depth variants of that, of that sleeper. Uh, but we still didn't think that we'd be able to achieve the full ballast depth. Um, so we had to seek authority to install substandard ballast depths. Um, so another design challenge was the positioning of the modular joints. So I showed you the modular joints before on, um, on the picture of the manufacturer's yard. So these joints, as I as um, suggested before, are a weak point in the track. So because they're held together by screws, um, they, they could potentially be installed wrong, not torqued to the correct torque. Um, over time, repeated load and the screws could work loose or they could fail. So th they're a risk. Um, so on, on, um, on like standard switch and crossing layouts, there's, there's standard drawings that show you where, to, where, these, um, where these joining plates, where these shroud plates need to be um, installed. But because this is a, a quite a complex layout and very bespoke, there was no standard drawing, so we had to actually um, work with our designers and other people to try and um, agree where to put these joints. So the diagram at the bottom shows where we eventually um, decided to put them. So we had some requirements. We had to try and keep them out of the through routes. That is the, the main high-speed um, routes. And um, that... You can see there that they're on the turn of routes, so uh, the, the 20 mile an hour um, line rather than the 100 mile an hour line. The other thing as well is that in an ideal world, we'd have liked to put in as long bearers as possible um, and, and only have one uh, one joint per bearer. But because um, of the limitations with manufacturing concrete in, in certain lengths, we couldn't actually achieve that. So you can see, um, you can see that there's two shrouds on some of these long bearers. Uh, and I say that's because the concrete manufacturers said that they couldn't physically make the bearers uh, any longer. Okay, so now onto the actual works themselves. Um, so plain lining, I mentioned plain lining before, which is um, basically removing the switches and crossings and just replacing them with rails and sleepers. Um, so you can see the top left-hand corner, this is um, a machine carrying out the dig. So the rail and sleepers have been removed and that machine is digging out the old ballast. And um, then on the picture below that, you can see the new ballast has been installed. And um, you can probably just about see there's a few guys in the background with um, a piece of equipment called a whacker plate. So that's a compaction um, compaction plate, which they um, travel up and down the site with, and it, it, it vibrates and compacts the ballast so it doesn't settle um, too much once the uh, trains start running them. And then on the right hand picture, you can see. Um, some of the new plain line sleepers and rail that we've installed. Uh, so one thing to, to mention here is that we've done this during July um, and the temperatures were really, really warm on some of the shifts. Um, and the plain line that we installed was, uh, we called it skeleton track. We, we, we installed it to, for construction purposes so that engineering trains could run on it, etc. Uh, but it was going to come back out again um, so that we could install the SNC afterwards. So it was just a temporary, a temporary situation. So because of that, um, obviously we didn't want to uh, we didn't want to install it to the full um, quality that we would with with permanent track. So we've installed sleepers and rails but no ballast around them. So um, apologies for telling people to suck eggs here, but uh, steel expands in, um, in heat. So rails will expand during hot weather. So these rails were actually installed. I think most of them were installed at night when it was quite cool. Um, but what we didn't always do was leave gaps between uh, one rail and the next. So what that meant was the next day when um, when the sun came out and it started to get hot, these these rails began to expand. 
Um, and this is a, obviously it's a well-known phenomenon in track and usually the ballast will um, help to restrain that uh, that movement and, and various other areas of the techniques that we do. But in this situation, we didn't have any ballast and the rails weren't um, stressed or anything like that. There's no gaps left in them. So what we found was that the rails were expanding and um, began to uh, cause misalignments in the track. So uh, track buckles, if it was in open lines, because it was in a possession, we would call it a misalignment. So we had to go and um, start cutting in joints to, to allow for that expansion. So something with hindsight, um, probably would have done differently. Just another thing to mention during the blockade. So I, I said before that it was a 16 day blockade of the West Coast, uh, but it wasn't unfortunately a full blockade. Uh, what we had to do, um, I think it was about two or three times a week, was um, open one line up to allow some freight traffic to pass through at night, um, usually. So the down main, which is the, the line on the right hand side of the picture, we had to plain line that. Um, but we had to actually install ballast and make sure it was fit for the passage of freight trains um, during, that, uh, during the blockade. So you can just see that that looks different to the other track. You can see it's ballast above, and you can also see a fence alongside so that when the freight trains were running, uh, a fence was erected so that uh, it protects staff from their movements. Okay, so panels. I showed you before a picture of uh, the panels laid out in the lay down area next to the track. So how did we get them to say? Well, we used the aforementioned massive crane and lifted them from the lay down area and then dropped them onto uh, trailers on the nearest line, uh, which would be up Hellsby line. And then we used the road rail vehicle to pull the trailers to site. So you can see the, um, if anyone's seen an RRV before, they're quite big machines, but that looks tiny compared to the crane you know, there. Uh, but yeah, so that was a, a move that um, happened repeatedly throughout the job. So this RRV went back and forth and um, loading up his, uh, his trailer with panels. You can see as well, you can see the uh, red paint on the ends of these panels. So they're all the right way. Uh, Scotland is in front of us, England behind us, so they're, they're all the right way. So that's good. Panel installation. So once the panels were brought to site, um, they were laid out on, um, on, one, of the, on one of the tracks. And then we use what's called the Kirov crane to pick them up and actually install them with a fine, um, fine alignment and installation of them. So you can see that's the Kirov crane sat on the sat on the track there with its beam, and uh, this is a panel being installed. So even though it's done by machine, unfortunately the uh, fine lining still has to be done manually, which isn't ideal. Uh, you, you wouldn't really want a guy stuck that close to a, a suspended load. Um, and I've had a few conversations on site about this. And, and whether it's the safest way to do it. And unfortunately, it appears that that is the only way at this point in time that, uh, that we can, that we can uh, line panels up. Hopefully in the future, some will come up with a, a better way of doing it, but it's really off now. So the picture on the right-hand side, again, just shows the key uh, come to site, loaded up with this being with a crane and the guys actually connecting everything up. So once the panels are all installed, you start to connect it all up. Uh, like a big jigsaw. So you can see on the left hand pictures, this is uh, the south end layout, looking at the switch down and the panels are all installed and beginning to be connected together. Um, and then uh, the right hand picture is, is past the north layout. Again, all okay, once everything's connected up, um, the ballast can be dropped. So this picture shows the top stone being dropped using, um, using a train and uh, auto ballasters. Um, so you can see that the guy walking along there with his face mask on and his, uh, his control thing, his control device in his hand. He's um, he's actually controlling the flow of stone from the train onto the track as it goes along. Um, so it's quite a quite a tricky job that to make sure you get the right amount because if you if you don't put enough stone out, um, you can have to go and drop more. If you put too much stone out, you can flood the site and it can be really difficult to to carry on um, doing the, the the next stages of the work which we should find out, unfortunately. Okay, so once all the stone's dropped, um, the site has to be tamped. So for anyone who doesn't know, tampers are machines which um, which lift and align the track to its design position and, and compress the um, compress the ballast underneath it by vibration. So this site, because of the complexity and because the, um, each line is tied together throughout the, throughout the layout over the short distance, we've done what was called quad tamping. So that's where you have um, four tampers which work through the site at one time. 
Uh, and that's, I've never seen it before. Uh, I believe this is how the maintainers have, have always done this junction because um, they're the only people that do. But I've never seen four tampers at once. I've um, seen two, but, but never four. So they're an expensive commodity. And it's, um, yeah, it, it, it sort of shows how complex the, the site was that we had to, that we were willing to, um, that we were willing to invest uh, in, in that many machines to do the work. So yeah, these four machines were linked together um, and, and traveled through the site together. Uh, Tamping the track. Picture on the right just shows a close up of the actual tamping equipment itself. If anyone hasn't seen it before. Okay, um, high, high speed handback. So, for anyone who, who's worked in renewals in the past, um, it, it, the, the usual process was to renew track and then um, open it up at 50 mile an hour speed restriction. That's that's kind of been the way we've done it for years and years. So, the reason for that speed restriction is that because we've installed all new ballast. Um, and components that things would set up under traffic. So um, that's how we've always done it. But over recent years, people have been uh, handed hand back at higher speeds, uh, which is good because it means that there's less delay minutes. It means that there's less effect on train services, less disruption to passengers. Uh, but it means that we have to do a, a lot more when we actually carry out the work to make sure that the track is safe for open up and higher speeds. So that process is called progressive assurance. So progressive assurance, so what we've done, um, we tightened some of the construction tolerances um, and we made sure that after every activity, we carried out an as-built survey and reported back the, the details straight away and that they were reviewed on every shift. So what I mean by that is, for example, when we uh, when we took the track out and, and done the dig, uh, the dig levels were measured and reported back and reviewed to check if they're acceptable. When we dropped the uh, new stone, Again, um, the, the levels were measured, checked, and um, made sure that um, made sure they, they were within the correct tolerances. And then um, at the end of the at the end of the site works, once once we had all this data, there was a massive amount of data. We actually had um, a continuous shift um, of, of people doing nothing but collect this data and analyze it. And um, that's how serious we had to take this. So at the end of it, um, we we all sat down, we went through all the data and um, this involved the uh, the people who were responsible for actually handing the track back, signing it to, to say it's fit for traffic, plus a, a team of senior engineers and managers. And what we managed to do was to hand back the uh, the, the West Coast main lines at 80 mile an hour. So I mentioned before the line speed was 100 mile an hour at this site, and we managed to hand back at 80. So not too not too much less than the uh, than the line speed, which was uh, which was a good result. And the Helsby lines, which are 75 mile an hour, we managed to hand them back at line speed, 75 mile an hour. So we're all, uh, we're all pretty pleased with that. We uh, took a lot of work, but we're uh, well. Okay, just one lesson learned as well. Um, so there was, we had to try and find some information about the site. So there used to be a ground frame um, at, at Acton Grange, just near the Bible. Um, we, we needed to, to know when it had been removed and we checked all um, all the records we had available but we couldn't actually find out when it when it was removed and then um, with a, a quick look on Google Earth if anyone's used Google Earth it's uh, um, you might not know you can do this but Google Earth has a, a, an aerial photography um, settings you can actually look back at, at uh, aerial photography from previous years so the pictures below and um, the right hand side shows the, the site um, Currently, or when it when it's off the screen, so 2018. The picture on the left um, actually shows the ground frame in situ, and the date at the top you can probably just about see is 2009. So um, by by using Google Earth, we were able to pinpoint it by by checking um, 2010 the ground frame had gone. So we were able to pinpoint when it was removed. Uh, but that, that can come useful for, for lots of lots of different um, lots of different activities. Okay, another. Another lesson learned, the staging between track works and civil engineering works or, or any other discipline is, uh, is, is really difficult to get right. And we did spend a lot of time at Acting Grange trying to make sure that when we've done um, civil's work, such as installing cable trotting routes along the side of the track or uh, ballast retention routes along the side of the track, we, we tried to make sure that we wouldn't go and destroy, um, destroy that afterwards with our, with our track activities. Um, and it didn't. It didn't always go as well as we'd hoped, and um, it was, as I say, it was really difficult. It's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to know which activities you should do first, and it's hard to actually um, estimate how much stone is going to be dropped on site and where it's going to flow to. So 
we ended up spending a lot of time having to um, dig dig out the fresh stone that we just poured because it had buried the uh, ballast retention and buried the cable trough and etc. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's a we were aware of it before and um, but it's a definite lesson that this uh, staging is key. Okay, another another um, thing we thing we learned from this job was about maintaining engagement. So. Uh, we, we renewed the track, the maintainer, as the maintainer after we walked away. So it's it's really important to try and engage with the maintainers early. Um, so what that does, it helps to build the relationship with them and build build a bit of trust. So hopefully they they know that you know that we're going to do the best job that we can, um, which in turn helps the handback process because once the job is complete, what we really want to do is hand it back to maintenance as soon as possible so that we're not. Um, we're not responsible for it anymore. We're not having to maintain it, but it's, it's in a fit condition for the for the track maintainer to just take it back. Um, so we, we, we did try and do that as much as possible. We tried to engage the maintainer with them at the design stage. So we showed them what we were doing, um, let them have some, uh, gave them some input into the design. Um, and then during the actual blockade itself, we, we had some walkouts with the, with the guys from the maintenance delivery unit. So they came out to walk through the site with us, uh, looked for any potential problems that they could see. Um, look for anything they thought might cause uh, a fault, and, and by doing that, we uh, quite quite a bit was identified, which um, hopefully reduced the amount of delay that this this, um, this site caused afterwards. Uh, but the, another another good thing was that because of having a relationship with the maintainer, um, if anything goes wrong on site, you've got um, you've got someone who you can call on to, to help you out. So the picture on the right hand side there is um, is the section manager, the track section manager from the from the Warrington depot. Um, and what he's actually doing there is one of the new crossings we installed, we discovered a crack in the crossing. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because we go on all day about that one, but um, discovered what looked like a crack in the crossing and we needed it to be inspected using uh, liquid penetrant testing. But we didn't have anyone on site um, or available who could actually do this. We didn't have anyone with the competence in absorbing material. Um, and so what we've done is just phoned up the maintainer, asked if they could help. And as it, as it happens, as you can see there, it became stripped out and tested it for us. And um, because of that as well, they were also aware straight away that there was a problem and that this could turn into a, a, a long-standing issue. Um, because crossings aren't um, aren't quick or easy to, to source if we had to replace it. So um, yeah, maintainer engagement is really important. Another lesson learned is about components and training. So before we done the job, we asked Network Rail's SSC inspection team, who I mentioned before, um, to come out to site and, and sit down with our, our construction guys and just just give them a little a little bit of a, a, a talk about any um, any little things that might catch them out with this particular layout, uh, just things to be aware of, and um, any any advice and guidance to try and avoid avoid these pitfalls. So that was that was really useful actually. Um, as well as that, there was some toolbox toolbox talks with the uh, with the construction team. So. And one in particular, we had some information sheets printed out for um, what are called E-plus clips. So if you look at the right-hand picture, that's an E-plus clip. Um, and it, even if you've never seen one before, you can probably see it doesn't look quite right. So the way that clip should work is that the, the, uh, the red metal um, clip is um, driven into the housing. And the end of the clip should fit over the top of this blue plastic insulator and hold it in place. Um, but you can see there that hasn't happened. The insulator's uh, bent upwards and has been um, being damaged, so that can be a, a, a massive problem. It doesn't look much, but that has caused major problems on other jobs, and it's prevented the jobs from being handed back. And um, so, if the if the if that insulator fails, it could result in um, could lead to track circuit failure. So, the purpose of the insulator is to electrically separate the uh, rail from the sleepers, and if they fail, then you could end up with a, a circuit taking a path through the sleepers and rails, and that could cause signal faults and block line and. Um, all kinds of delays. Uh, the other thing it does is maintains gauge, which is the distance between the two rails. So again, if these insulators fail and drop out, the, the rails can move further apart and could end up with wide gauge failures. Um, so we briefed the guys on this before the job, and during the during the um, job itself, we, we had some more briefings actually while while people were installing it. But one of the issues is you need the set, you need the different tools to install this type of clip than you do for all the other clips that we use. And that's it doesn't sound much, but when you when you're doing this work at night or um, you know in the in the heat of battle sort of thing, it, it can be quite difficult to make sure that you've got the right tool. 
Uh, to my mind, you should have one type of fastening and one type of tool, and then it's then it's kind of foolproof. But uh, yeah, so despite all the briefings we've done, we still ended up with quite a lot of installed wrong, so we have to go back and, and uh, replace them. But it would have been a lot worse had we not done the briefings. Okay, so last couple of little bits for me. I've got some videos um, of, of some of the work on site. Uh, they're only very short, and um, there's, there's no sound, but hopefully there's not, because uh, one's got some someone swearing in the background, so hopefully the sound doesn't come through. But um, I tried playing these, but I know for a fact that this um, these will be jerky because of this uh, this uh, software we're using at the moment to, to, to hold this meeting, go to the meeting. It doesn't work very well on video, so um, it, it'll be more like a, a, a stop frame photography, so I'll just, I'll just play them anyway. So this is aluminothermic welding, for anyone who's not seen it before. So this is a method of um, welding two rails together. So before this, the, the weld has to be set up, which takes quite a bit of time, it has to be aligned, and then there's a mould um, built around the around the two rail ends to be joined. And then um, this uh, chemical reaction, which you'll see shortly, um, cause the molten metal into the mould and, and that joins the two uh, rails together. Like one finite this, isn't it? So that's a thermal bell to anyone who's never seen one before. And then next, so after the welding has been done and the moulds are removed and the weld has to be cleaned up and ground so that it's got the correct profile, the same profile as the rail, rail either side. So there's a um, rail ground there taking place. Actually, just before I start, the, the picture on the left hand side, the guy's using uh, a needle gun, which gets, gets off the residue of the, of the moulds. And then the guy on the right is using the actual grinder. To, Okay, it's very quick. Hopefully, you've seen something there. But, uh, oh, come on. Next. Okay, uh, next is just a, a quick um, a quick shot of a tamper in operation. So, I showed just in tamper before, but this is just to give an idea of what they look like when you wear it. If you haven't seen it. Okay, and then the next few videos are just um, after we've done the job, after, after we completed it and opened it back up to traffic. Um, I went out and, and done a cab ride, and um, so sat, sat in the front with the driver on some passenger trains going across the across the site, and um, just to see how it how it um, behaves under traffic. So I'll just show you these ones. So this first one is on the up main, so this is coming from Warrington and um, going through the site towards uh, towards Crew. You see the 80 mile an hour speed board. Okay, so this is coming through the north end past the junction, and then across the switch diamonds, and then across the south end of the junction. But you, you can see on that one how, how different the two halves of the junction are in, in terms of how far apart or um, how close together they are. Okay, so that's the up main. And then the down main, so this is coming from the crew direction towards Warrington. You can see there as well the embankments, you can see on the left hand side how, how high and steep the site is. Okay, and then um, the next two are just um, are just showing a train or a train passing across some of the switch diamonds. So this is the upheld piece. This is going from uh, Warrington towards Chester.
You can see some of the other things we had to build, like on the left, that platform, and on the right, then uh, location case platforms were, were newly installed as part of this job as well. So it wasn't just track, there was a, uh, every discipline had um, a lot of involvement in this job. Okay, and then last one is the downhills, because this is coming from the Chester direction um, across the diamonds towards Warrington. But just before this one starts, you can see in front of us the, um, the two panels, uh, the, that's our road rail access points, that's where our um, on-track machines got on site from the uh, site compound and just to the to the right you can actually see the site comp compound itself so when the train starts moving you should see that on the right Okay, and that's uh, that's it. That's the lot. So, has anyone got any questions? No, is a good answer. Chris, there's a couple of questions come through on the chat. Um, right, okay. uh, first, from Dave Woods, he's asking how much more additional work or engineers are needed to achieve the benefits of progressive assurance for a higher speed handback. Um, it's what we what we done on this job was we had. Um, Two people per shift, and uh, for most of the shifts, we've done nothing else but progressive assurance. Um, so, yeah, it, th that that seemed to work. It still it, there were some days where they didn't have a great deal to do. There's other days where they had too much to do. But that's what that's what we found. And um, the actual for the for the guys doing the actual work on site themselves, um, I don't think it's a great deal more. It just means they have to do a little bit more surveying at the end of the um, at the end of each activity, but uh, and, and a bit more paperwork to fill out. Um, but I don't think it was a huge amount. Uh, if you ask them, they might, they might uh, tell you something different, but I, I don't think it was a huge amount of extra work. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, another question from Alan, Alan Gibbs Monaghan was, as there were so many welds to undertake, was consideration given to use in the mobile flash foot welder? Um, I, don't, I don't believe it was, Alan, no, um, because why didn't we use the mobile flash foot welder? Um, I, I'm not because it was installed in panels rather than being a, a big plain line job. I don't know if it would have been feasible to, to do that. And because the um, because of the stage in the job, we, we'd be welding um, one part while we were doing another type of work down the other end of the site. So I think the flash foot welder probably works better when it's got a long a long run to go at. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't know for definite. That's that's what I, I, that's uh, that's why I think we didn't look at it. Um, I've got another question from Harvey Tatlow who asks, with regards to the split bearers on the switch diamonds, do you have any feedback on how they're performing? Um, I don't, but um, Alan Gibbs Monaghan may do, or if any of the other maintenance guys are on the call, they might know how they're, how they're doing now. Um, I've not heard of any faults there, or um, I've not seen any fault reports from site, but I think anyone got more info than that. Does anybody like to ask any questions? If you do, please just unmute yourself and um, fire away. Hi, Chris. Hello. It's Nathan Chubb. Um, Hi, David. Um, just a quick query about the site compound. Um, how, uh, how do you return it? To, uh, what happened after you left the site? How has it returned back to not being hard standing? The, sorry, is that the field? Is it the build-up area? Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know if it's actually been whether it's complete or not yet. I believe it was planned to be completed in January, but I actually left the team in October last year, so I didn't get to see see um, see what it looked like at the end. But the the agreement was that we had to 
leave this we had to remove everything from the site we had to remove all the um all the uh aggregates that we've installed and, and return it back to its previous condition well as close to previous as we could so yeah ho hopefully that happened but i don't know cheers Chris, it's uh, Richard Yates here. Um, hi, just to confirm, yes, it has been reinstated to how it was, and that's done before, uh, by the close of play of uh, December last year, that was. All oh, right, great. Thanks for that, Richard. And were, were they happy with it? Did they, was there any fines or anything, or were they pleased with the, uh, with the result? <laughs> uh, yeah, they were pleased with the results, yeah. Um, we had to leave the existing, one of the gates in, uh, which we'd installed for us, but, uh, but yeah, they're, they're very happy with it, so it's... Uh, yeah, perfectly executed that one. So. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, so it's Matt Davis here. I've got a quick question. But, um, you use skeleton traps with plain line with new materials. What then happens to them materials? We reuse them. So we took them out, and uh, most of them, or a lot of them, were re re reused for, um, for other bits of plain line that we had to remove. Within the job, and um, so there was there were some um, some panels that couldn't be reused, so they were basically um, left on site, I believe, and um, for maintenance spares. But yeah, uh, we we used them wherever possible. Okay. Chris, another question from the chat. Um, Joe Yates asks which Tampa took the lead for the alignment for the quad tamping. Which Tampa took the lead? <laughs> Um, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> no idea. I don't know. The one that was at the front. <laughs> yeah, I was going to just say the one on the left, just to give an answer. But uh, yeah. Chris, uh, it's Pete, Pete Barry, are there? Um, I know one thing off the back of that quad tamping. The issue we obviously had on the site was that the tampers weren't all from the, uh, the same supplier. Mm, um, yeah. So I know we. I remember correctly, we did have some issues with actually connecting them together via the umbilical cord. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, probably another lesson there about trying to get the four tampers from the same supplier so they could work together a bit better. Yeah. Anyone else? Any more questions, guys? Hello, it's Brian Counter here. Can you hear me? Hey, Brian. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Brian Counter Philip. It's a bit of a technical question on the track on the track design. It was just really. Do, do you know what the what the interval was between uh, between the two sets of lines? Was it fairly stand? You know, was it fairly standard, or did it vary quite a lot? Um, it, it definitely varied at the ends um, because the because the tracks turned out at either end, and at the at the viaduct end, um, there was a, a, re a reverse curve before you got onto the viaduct. Um, through the SNC itself, uh, I'm going to second. I've actually got the design to hand. Which is perfect. Um, I'm pretty sure it was um, it was quite uniform through the SNC itself, with the rest of the site. I can see some numbers on there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Looks like it's 1970 through the middle, doesn't it? Through yeah, it middle. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just saying that. It was. It's just interesting for me because we're doing a course on track design next week uh, in a virtual way, which is the first time we've done it, and I'm just fascinated oh. by your diagram, Chris. So I might, I might be pinching it to show the people on the course, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. And then um, the, the, the guy who designed it, he might even still be on the call, Nick Aldridge Cox. Um, he, he may, uh, he may, he may want to have, have a chat with him as well if there's any uh, any in depth technical stuff. Oh, Nick, did you say Nick Aldridge Cox? I did, yeah. Oh, yeah. right, yes, I have come across him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, I think he's, yeah, I think he's actually, on, I think he's actually online. I noticed his name on the list. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure. Uh, Contact me whenever you whenever you want, and I'll, I'll provide whatever I've got. And I'm sure that will be. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Much yeah, appreciated. Yeah,
Okay, anything else? Hi, Chris, it's Mike. Hi, Mike. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I noticed there was a, obviously there's a very flat 30,000 metre radius mm -hmm. in the SNC. Was that yeah. looked at to, obviously, to take that out to put a straight? Is there any negatives to obviously putting that in from a construction point of view? Um, or yeah. From the SNC design? Yeah, no, we did. We tried to optimise the alignment as much as we could by getting rid of anything like that. But unfortunately, if, if it's if it's on there now, it's because we couldn't design it out. Um, particularly, as I said before, with the, with the tie-ins to the viaduct. Um, so, yeah, we, we we couldn't avoid it, unfortunately. Um, just one, one point before before we got this design. So it's been, it's been um, worked up to a certain point by another design team before it arrived with, uh, with our project. Um, they actually uh, they um, done a design line that's all the way across the viaduct and beyond. Um, so we, we we trimmed it back quite a lot to, to avoid, um, like I said before, to avoid going onto that viaduct and causing causing any uh, any problems which we didn't need to. Anything else? Any last questions? Hi, Chris. David Chubb again. Really quick last one. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, it was 20 mile an hour on one side and 50 on the other. Was there any scope at all to increasing the speeds through there? No, no, there wasn't. So um, this this site, as I said at the beginning, it's it's, it's been a difficult site for the maintainer. Um, so switch diamonds are complex and prone to failure. And it's just, so in an ideal world, what we would have done would, would be to completely open out the junction and do away with the switch diamonds. Um, but unfortunately, there was no there was no um, funding available to do anything like that or to um, to open out the, the other switch diamonds. Because to do that, you'd have to um, rebuild the obviously rebuild the OLE and the overhead electrification. Um, there's a load of other constraints around the site, so there's under bridges, tunnels, things like that, all in the way. Um, so there was no space to do it and there's no funding, unfortunately. Um, it's a shame because obviously we spent a, a lot of time doing this work um, and it would have been lovely if we could have uh, got rid of all the, uh, all the maintenance headaches, but no, unfortunately not. Okay, anyone else? I think that sounds like um, the questions have dried up. So um, can I take the opportunity, Chris, to say thank you very much? I know it wasn't the um, the medium at which you were intended to present, but, but that was that was a really great talk. So thank you very much. And thank you for everyone else for joining us, including uh, Liverpool and North Wales section. It's been great to, to join up and, um, and present a really, what I hope is a successful meeting. Um, if anybody wants to give any feedback, then then please then please do please let us know how you you think it went. We certainly won't be replacing um, section meetings because we know people do like them for network and, and etc. But I think it's certainly another form of technology we can utilise in the future. Um, we hope to hear you to join us next month to hear about train planning with Rob Cummins on May the seventh. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, Thank you. Everyone. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.